Jan, so good to see you. And yes. I can't believe that this marathon that you have been running has finally come to an end. And like all these things that go on and on, it just kind of went out with a puff. Yeah, yeah. It's been nine years of my journalistic <laughs> reporting life. I wrote the first story in 2015 about like uh, a huge uh, trove of weapons that were found in, in a small town in the center of the country. And that sort of led to a number of murders that were in in the core of the Marengo trial against uh, Tahi. Mm. And, um, and yeah, yesterday, finally a verdict after, you know, a court procedure that lasted for six years. Uh, I don't know if that in, in Irish perspective, if that's long or short. Oh, but that's, for me, oh God, that's long. That is long yeah. for anyone. Yeah. yeah. And uh, as expected, he was uh, convicted to uh, a life in jail. And in the Netherlands, that means probably for him a life in jail. Right. I was actually going to ask you that, if that's what it meant, or is there a, a certain period of time after which they can look for parole? Taggy uh, wasn't there, which is disappointing. He wasn't even there on video. No, no. He, um, the thing was, you know, um, this story has so many like different bends and angles and turns and corners. But last year, uh, maybe we talked about it on your podcast. His, his first lawyer, uh, a woman called Ines Wesky, was arrested mm. for being part of his criminal organization. And she's actually going to be prosecuted probably somewhere this year. Um, and he got like a new team of lawyers, uh, but they were so disappointed with uh, the the fact that they got very little time to sort of, uh, you know, mop up the last details in the trial that at one point they said, you know, we're going to stop as his lawyers for now because we feel that you know, the court is not taking us seriously. And at that point, Tachi said, well, you know, uh, F this, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not showing up anymore. And uh, you do what you want to do. And uh, so he didn't even take the effort to follow it on uh, like a, a video link uh, connection. Mm. And uh, it made me think of um, one of his first um, moments after his arrest, he was um, uh, interviewed by the police. And he said, yeah, you know, you have trial by media, but in my case, you also have judged by media and I'm already given a lifetime sentence. So mm. why bother? Mm. And yeah, in the end, uh, in some ways he was right. Although he was, um, he, he was suspected of committing, being involved in six murders, four attempted murders and four preparations to commit murder and then and and then in and then as the the 15th count on his indictment was being the leader of this murderous criminal organization mm. and he did not get convicted on all points so one of the uh murders uh he was actually uh acquitted so in the end out of the six murders that he uh was uh, indicted on five murders according to the court, were uh, proven uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. And those murders happened within a very short 18-month period, really. So there was, you know, there was a huge savagery to the ordering and the carrying out of these. But it was June of last year, I was over with you in Amsterdam and we mm -hmm. went to the court. And at the time, mm -hmm. I think Ines Wesky had been arrested. There was quite a lot of shock about that. Um, as we stood outside the bunker waiting to go in. Her son, as far as I can recall, came along. And I remember asking you, had he, you know, was he going to announce his new lawyers or what? So all of that was happening at the time. And sure enough, Riddu and Taggy did appear that day on a video screen. Um, I was quite glad to have caught a glimpse of him because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I knew that was going to be it. That was the only opportunity I would have had. I got this kind of impression from him that he was very smug, very self-satisfied, very confident. Um, and, you know, colleagues of yours described him as having his game face on. So this whole trial to him was almost a competition at game. But mm -hmm. he, he's one of the most 
frightening gangland figures really to have come out of the European underworld um, ever, I think. He came from a background of a street dealer and became a massive, incredibly wealthy cocaine mm-hmm. kingpin, just like Daniel Kinahan, very, mm-hmm. very quickly. And of course, Daniel Kinahan himself and others did come together to form what we call the European super cartel. Um, mm-hmm. But going back to the beginning, to that first story you wrote in, in 2015 mm-hmm. and that arms fight. So was he known then? No, actually, um, uh even the police had very, very little insight into who he was and the role he played. So, and it went to the point that, um, you know, he, so there was an arrest made, there was a lot of weapons found. And then the investigation into the group that was linked to Tahi uh, was about, the suspicion was that they were um, preparing gangland murders. So they found weapons, they found fast cars, with, you know, the bottles of gasoline to put them on fire after they used them, all that kind of material that pointed to preparation of. And they had also, like, followed a number of uh, possible uh, victims, made photos, videos, uh, uh, administered where they went, the places they visit and stuff like that. And then uh, two of these uh, people started talking to the police because they were afraid of Tahi. And in those um, the reports of those interviews, they write Ridwan Stahi's name mm. with the wrong spelling. So that's how little they know. They knew they did not even know how to spell his name properly. And then what they did find was some information on uh, a police investigation in Spain, where he was a suspect um, uh, either in relation to a shooting or in relation to uh, trafficking, drug trafficking, has never been cleared up really. But but nobody knew him. Mm. And and then, you know, the first murder occurred two months later in September. And it was like an employee of a spy shop where you can buy all kinds of goodies that criminals like to use to uh, for their uh, daily uh, activity. And um, uh, Tahi suspected that uh, they had played a double role in the investigation into his group and the the, the, the weapons they found. And so they he decided to have him murdered. And then they also planned to like shoot a bazooka at that spy shop building uh, as an extra message. And that that attempt in the end never happened and it, it failed. Um, but um, looking back at that, it's sort of also for me, it, put it in a much, much better perspective because what it actually was, what, what this trial was really about was there is an investigation into criminal activity and then the criminals, they start to push back. Mm-hmm. So they're really fighting the government about the fact that they're being investigated and, and the violence with, uh, you know, that happened, that the amount of violence that they used to sort of like prevent or to to push back against the government, that is in the end what I think this case uh, makes so unique. And also maybe it says something about his character that mm. is quite, yeah, I mean. Um, like he's, it's, to, it's sort of like as if he sort of exploded into, yeah. you know, your conscience and, and that of the, the nation of the Netherlands, because what, yeah. what came after in, in more recent years has been shocking. Um, yeah. in the extreme. But before that, say pre-2015, pre this moment of paranoia, mm-hmm. maybe when he decides that this spy shop guy is working mm-hmm. as a double agent against him, is there evidence of a mental health breakdown coming to that? Is there evidence of him running a really efficient drug operation and, and running it business like, i.e. not killing people? No, there is no. So there is, at that point, there was no evidence of that at all. Um, I mean, we did learn a little bit about his character. He, I mean, he actually went to the highest level of high school that you can go to in the Netherlands. So he, he's a, a smart man. Mm-hmm. Um, we also know that he was, when he was a teenager, he was bullied. Uh, so he, he started out as a small time 
hashish dealer, you know, uh, grams on the street. And he was oftentimes bullied and, you know, people steal his money or his, his, uh, his, his drugs. Um, so maybe there is some like, you know, anger build up uh, in him about that. But, you know, one of the things that also I found back is after that first, uh, you know, um, uh, found, after they first found those, that big trove of weapons, you know, he said to one of his uh, comrades, he said, uh, mate, we did it. We worked along your lines of working, but now we're going to do it my way. Right. And then, and he, and then he's, he cited, he told somebody else, you know, now they're going to find out how, what, how fa- anger feels like, what anger feels like. And it's those kinds of words that sort of show what you said, you know, there is this uh, uh, like really negative energy uh, mm. coming out of him at that point. And it just explodes uh, in a series because, you know, I'm, I'm I'll try to keep it simple, but Marengo is just one trial. Mm. Uh, with six murders, but there was another trial that was also related to Tahi with another series of murders, uh, which, you know, a, a judge ruled that he was also like the, the instigator of those murders. So the six is just a small part of the amount of, of murders, gangland murders that have been committed in his name. Uh, and of course, the, the high profile murder of the um, the the brother of the state witness, Nabil B, yeah. the lawyer, Dirk Worsham, and yeah. of course, Peter Ordevries, the journalist who was also working with him. Mm-hmm. Um, all pretty much, we can say, suspected of being ordered by Taggy from behind bars. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the last one, probably from behind bars. We don't know the details, but, you know, the, the Dutch Public Prosecutor's Office has been increasingly voicing their theory mm. that Tahi is behind uh, those three killings. And there is also some evidence of possible involvement of family members of his in those killings. Um, and yeah, one of the big questions is, will they ever be able to prove that they were really ordered by him? And, and of, uh, uh, of course, more went on. I mean, you know, newspaper uh, offices, they, they he tried to or he certainly his grouping yeah. or associates tried to firebomb them. There are journalists who are under uh, protection, possibly will be for the rest of their days. The Prime Minister Ruta was at one yeah. point targeted and the royal family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, I mean, this was an absolute, um, you know, this was a Pablo Escobar style uh, war with the state, the entire democracy of the Netherlands that this one man and with with a, a big following kind of went on. But to go back to 2015 and the start mm-hmm. of the story and, and I suppose your involvement with it. So he was at that point a multimillionaire. He'd made a lot of money from cocaine dealing. He's Moroccan background and would have had a long sort of history, perhaps, of smuggling through those routes mm-hmm. from Morocco. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 very, very, uh, it's not proven in the sense that, you know, it's, but it's very, um, uh, it, it's very likely mm. that that's how he, he became bigger. So he started as a street dealer. He comes from the North Eastern region of Morocco originally. That's where he was born and his, his, uh, father and, uh, uh mother come from. And that is a region where, there is quite a large production of uh, hashish. So it is very likely that that was his first path into mm-hmm. the criminal world. And um, uh, probably he became a, a, a bigger trafficker. And then at one point, so around 2004, five, six, that time frame, um, there was this story about the West African trampoline where, where you know, the, the cartels from South uh, uh, America we're starting to smuggle, to traffic cocaine through Western Africa. And it's it's very likely that he became, you know, one of the people that that 
uh, started trafficking cocaine, and that's where his um, his uh, success is coming from. Mm. And of course, but, I mean, interestingly, wasn't you know, he a perfect age as well, Jan? Similar to to Daniel Kinnan, yeah. he's what about forty six now, so he would yeah. have been he would have been just perfectly placed at that moment when there's that cocaine gold rush starts. Yeah. You know, yeah, now that that's very true, and and but the interesting thing is. Uh, he has no previous convictions <laughs> for any of this, none. Mm. So you know, the Spanish at one point had some suspicious, but they never, they never developed it, or they, they it never led to anything. Uh, so, it, if you think about it, you know that that it's it's quite spectacular that somebody in this environment is able to stay undercover for like fifteen years, mm. and then. When they finally, you know, a little bit by chance hit a group that he works with, that then, you know, then it comes into light with this massive energy yeah. uh, and, and the violence against it. Because yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my notes from, from uh, the verdict yesterday and um, the court cited a few things. So one of the things was violence as a means to, to, uh, to sow fear. Uh, amongst his peers in the criminal world, but also in the rest of the country, and um, they they qualified it as as terror. Mm. Um, so yeah, you know you, what you have in in Latin America is you have narco terrorism. Basically, the Dutch court says the same. And then the final thing they said, you know, we think since you've committed all these violent crimes, you deserve a life in prison because of that, you know, as retribution to the, the, the victims. But we also think that you will continue to do this if you were to be set free. So in order to protect the society against you, we also think that you should spend the rest of your life behind bars. And I've spoken to a number of lawyers and colleagues and, and people who know this environment. And they all said, you know, this is the qualifications that the court gave to his behavior. Mm. Uh, they have all never seen it, anything like it. Does that mean he's unique and there isn't another taggy or there isn't too many of them? There must be just a finite amount of people like that that are that angry against the entire yeah. state and, and the, the whole, you know, are angry, obviously, that he's been targeted, but there was there's more than that there, isn't there? There's more than just the normal sort of, uh, you know, I've worked really hard for this cocaine empire, therefore I should be allowed to live off the fruits of this. There seems to be just a step more with Taggy in his utter anger and distaste and almost an anarchy against society as a whole. Yeah, yeah. I've, I mean, I've I've spoken to a number of uh, fairly influential criminals in the Netherlands about this, about, you know, how, how do you see it? And what they say is, yeah, you know, if you're in this business or if you're trafficking cocaine and somebody steals from you or somebody um, uh, tries to do you harm or then you know what the ultimate sanction is, you know, there is this, uh, I don't know if you can call it a moral code, but there is this code that if you take, if you do certain actions, you know what the consequences can be. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so, but this type of violence is is very different. So there is some of uh, some of it is related to conflicts in in uh, in the underworld, but but that that you know killing of of uh, you know witnesses of people who are you know not involved in the criminal world at all, but just because they. Uh, get you know a letter from a from a from a from a judge saying you know you have to hand over this ad administration because we're looking into uh, something that that's the reason to get killed that has never been seen before and also criminals say you know that is not the way we should work that's just, this is not the way it should be and in that sense is he unique uh, well we haven't seen anybody like this. Um, and, uh, I think a lot of people hope that they will never see anything like this again. Mm. Um, and, um, that's, yeah, actually 
one of the questions I get very often, you know, do you think this was like an incident, like like once in a lifetime uh, explosion of violence? Or is this the new normal? Is this what we should get used to? And uh, yeah, I hope it's the first, uh, because if 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 this is the new normal, then um, uh, it's gonna it's gonna be hard to stay a crime reporter, for yeah, instance, because for it's, sure. it's very hard to work under these kind of circumstances. It's uh, gonna alone it's, all the other- it'd be hard to protect society. I mean, if yeah. you have somebody like this, and of course you've all the corruption as well that's going on yeah. the, at the same time. So he's essentially he's he's down in Spain, but he also has a large grouping in the Netherlands, and he's controlling the port of Rotterdam, one of the biggest ports of entry into Europe, has influence in Antwerp as well. Now that's a really significant positioning to have to have those people in your pocket in the ports to be able mm-hmm. to say you can get you know you can get your load your your product through. But he's down in Spain where he meets up with Daniel Kinahan and various other people. And he's there in around the 2016 when, of course, Daniel Kinahan gets involved in his own war here in in Ireland, which puts a lot of pressure on him. I think European police forces are coming together anyway, outside of these things that are happening Mm -hmm. in our two countries. Um, And they all en masse nearly sort of migrate to the Gulf then. They go to Dubai. Taggy yep. Kinahan and others, Imperiale, etc. There's the famous mm-hmm. wedding of Daniel Kinahan out there in 2017, which they all attend. That gives a little bit of kudos to what has been said by some of the, the Dutch members of the grouping who've gone to police because they're afraid of Taggy. They're afraid they're going to die and they've been giving, informing uh, against him. So mm-hmm. they're in the Netherlands and um, you also have, of course, the, the Chilean uh, mm-hmm. out there, El, El Rico. Um, mm-hmm. So they all become sort of business partners, but also friends. So Taggy seems to be able to live a somewhat normal life out there, despite all this chaos. He's he's mm-hmm. he's mm-hmm. like a cartoon, really bad guy. But he's also, he's living while on a false passport. He's attending social events. He's mixing with people. He's able to conduct friendships and is there relationships out there? Is there women? Is there? He, ha- yeah, he was he he was married at the time. So when all the these investigations were going on, he was married. He has uh, four now. He has six children. Um, actually, his oldest son is also now a suspect in a in an ongoing investigation into a criminal organization. Um, and um, yes, it is fascinating to see that. Even though he's on the radar from the summer of 2015, 2015, that he can still go to this like big uh, wedding in Dubai, uh, like there is no yesterday or no tomorrow. That that is the normalest thing, because back you know after that 2015 event, there was an investigation into him, and he knew that, mm-hmm. uh, and. Um, they at the time felt very safe, and what we what we do have to remember is, you know, like that wedding of of, of uh, Daniel Kinahan. That was just at this tipping point where they started to to like uh, hack the 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 crypto phone companies, and you know, initially they found the phone here and there, but at that point, you know, there is this trove of messaging that that points to uh, what they're actually really doing. So. Um, and that also played in the Marengo trial. Those messages played a, a, a very important role in terms of evidence and understanding what they're really doing. Mm. Um, what I find disappointing about that material in relation to Tahi there is because it's the whole investigation centers around murder and violence. You you don't see all the details of the drug network behind mm. it because it's basically not selected into the files. But anyway, back to your question. Yes, he was being able to live the life of a, a, a socialite, mm. and then but he at one point he became um, separated from his family, so he sort of did not feel safe. Seems like he he wanted to be separated to keep his family safe. And yeah, it's it's very hard to really understand what happened back then. But it, 
also that that violence, you know, it it seems like it's also like it's the the government fault mm. it's the prosecutor's fault that i cannot be with my family anymore and that 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 type of of feelings also you know translated into more violence um and um, and why did he he felt his family couldn't be out in the in the gulf with him in in dubai with him i think so and i also yeah because i think they have been in dubai for a while and they were also going back and forth between dubai spain and uh, morocco Mm. Um, and that is, uh, to be honest, uh, we don't really know uh, yeah. how that actually uh, happened. Uh, what we do know is that he was traveling on fal- uh, false uh, passports. And they were also, um, there is evidence that they had corrupt uh, employers at the customs who were also checking the false passports, you know, the, 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 to, to see whether they were still safe to travel with. So they had like multiple layers of security for them to, 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 to make sure that they wouldn't get caught mm. at a border or in an airport or something like that. Um, so they were very aware of the fact that, that they were being looked at and, and that the police was uh, trying to uh, maybe uh, arrest them uh, or him. But um how that you know how that really relates to his family and and at one point he got separated that is clear but that is, i don't know mm, mm. so he was arrested out there ultimately in 2019 um yes. he was sort of the most wanted man i think there was something um in the netherlands was there either a reward issued for him or he was named uh, fully, there was something that 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 was. I remember speaking to you at the time was kind of like unprecedented. That um, yeah, yeah, he was at one point. I think they put like fifty thousand or a hundred thousand euros on his, you know, uh, on his head. So inf- you know, they would pay that for information leading to his arrest. Um, and some strange things happened regarding. Uh, two lawyers that went out, supposedly they yeah. were under surveillance at the time. They were expected to be meeting with Taggy and they were under surveillance in, in a hotel by Dubai police when, of course, what they were calling the boss of bosses arrived in. And that was Daniel Kinahan as opposed to Taggy. And that yes. was a very strange little piece of the, the jigsaw that maybe we haven't got to the bottom of yet, what was <laughs> totally going on there. Nonetheless, he's brought back and this Marengo trial which is not just Taggy, but is it uh, fourteen other of members of no, his gang? No, no, no. There, there was there was in altogether was seventeen suspects. Seventeen, uh, and one of the suspects was a deal witness. So he he uh, he went to the police and he betrayed his his uh, his group of uh, 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 mates, mm. and they were all convicted. So some of them for relatively small. Uh, uh, um, indictments but all the 17 suspects were convicted for being a member of this criminal organization with this murderous intent now um, the size of that trial caused a number of problems for lots of reasons but in the middle of it of course came along a pandemic which didn't help because mm-hmm. each of those suspects had a legal team the uh Courts, there was a lot of fear that uh, Taggy or maybe others might try and escape or be escaped. So that there was a lot of security around the going to and from that uh, courtroom, which was called the bunker in an mm. industrial estate. Um, how is the other building coming along? I hope it'll soon be finished, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> uh, was, we, we all hope so. But yeah. so what they're now doing is they're building a prison on on the facility of a uh, sorry, they're building Court a courtroom room. on yeah. the facility on the uh, of on the premises of a prison. Yeah, which will uh, make more but, sense. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, you know, in 2021, he tried to make a plan to break out the most, you know, the, the Dutch Supermax prison. Um and uh Luckily, uh, they they uh, they caught him before they could. Uh, and, uh, so it basically, so he's behind bars. This trial is stopping and starting. It was very frustrating because you'd get a little bit of a kind of an opening up of lockdowns and you'd maybe get a few days hearings. And then, you know, there was all sorts of complications. But in the mm. meantime, he's behind bars. He's agitating a lot. He's, you know, he's suspected of coming up with these plots to kill. Um, and he's also trying to, find a way to escape like what was his plan to to get out of a supermax prison they had they had a 
they had like three uh, versions of a plan. And one of them was like really get into that uh, that that uh, supermax uh, uh, secured prison, and they were talking about Navy SEALs and real pros, and they uh, they were like, yeah, you know, we have to, we need like fifteen hundred liters of 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 crude oil to like spread on the roads so the police cars will you know slip. Uh, that those kind of plans. There is like a second version of the plan that seems to uh, uh, link to an escape while being uh, transported from the supermax prison to the bunker, the the, mm-hmm. the courthouse. And then there was a third version where they were uh, talking about uh, kidnapping a number of uh, people who work in the prison and then to see if they could, you know, like like uh, yeah, kidnapping people, and then you know have this like prisoners exchange, so they would be able to free him mm. by uh, uh, trading him for those uh, the the police of the prison. Those are the three scenarios that were spoken about uh, between him, his lawyer, also nephew, and you know people outside, and. Tahi always said, yeah, you know, this is all bullshit. We, we were just joking around. This was not serious. Well, nobody takes that serious. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, and um, uh, I think we also have to say, we, I don't, it's not very clear how close they came to really do this. Um, so they were, they were surely, for instance, looking for addresses of people that work as guards in the in the prison uh, where he's uh, where he's being taken uh, uh, captive, um, so they were actually really planning. But how far they they came, and if they already, for instance, hired like you know Navy SEAL type people uh, to to execute this this breakout. Uh, we don't know. But they were taking no chances. And of course, they did also uncover a plan, a plot to uh, escape Nwaf al Fasi, one of his uh, business partners here in Ireland, who has been held in Port mm-hmm. Leash Prison, the highest security prison in the country. Um, mm-hmm. And he was here on remand awaiting extradition to the Netherlands. And I think that was rushed through when they realised that they were seriously going to try and escape him out of prison. The Dutch yeah. military came to Ireland to collect him that time and bring him back. Um, yeah. they're, they're just, is there something in the background? I mean, we talk about the anger he has for the state of the Netherlands and for all its institutions. Is there something to do with his origins as as a Moroccan? Is there is there something to do with his anger against the state about the way he was treated? Was there any sort of uh, evidence? I mean, you've said he reached the top of his his education and he obviously completed school. So there just has to if you feel there has to be something there to yeah, explain. I don't think there's going to be sort of a a smoking gun is that a teacher told him that he was, you know, worthless and would never make it to anything. But it just feels as if there's something huge there in his background. Yeah, I know. I, if you so if you read his messaging, you know, about uh, through, uh, you know, the messages on those crypto phones, you, you feel that anger. But it's very hard to pinpoint where it comes from. Mm. So I've always had this theory that he f- he was when he was a teenager, he was bullied. He was frustrated about that, and he was he is fairly s- small. He's not a big, strong man. Mm. Uh, this also frustrated him maybe, and that that you know that anger combined with a very smart uh, uh, a pair of uh, you know smart brain, mm. an intelligent uh, person that sort of led him to at one point take revenge on the rest of the world. I mean, but I mean, you know, this is like a theory. I know. There is no, it's very hard. You know, there is some, uh, you know, there is also some dialogue where his wife talks to him at that point around 2016, 17. And, you know, that he's so angry. And why is he so angry? Mm. And, uh, you know, be careful that you don't infect the rest of your family with your anger. That kind of talk is there so obviously there is something there Mm. but where that comes from you know uh, it's something i mean you would want to talk to him 
yeah. about it. You know, you want to be able to ask, you know, you want to be able to understand where where does this come from? How does this came about? Because it's obvious that it's that anger is not only because somebody stole a thousand kilos of cocaine. Mm. There is something else besides that. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And and yeah, I'm I'm I actually I think you know also other people in the underworld they don't really understand where this is coming from. No, and I think maybe as human beings, we we always have to try and seek an answer to that because we don't like mm -hmm. the idea that we, we don't understand it because then mm -hmm. we, we, yeah. it puts us more at risk. Now, at, having said that, like a lot of people who make it to significant positions in the criminal underworld are anti-establishment. Mm -hmm. They're pretty anarchist. They, you know what I mean? Yeah. They don't really have much respect for the state or the organs of it. So there's a mm -hmm. bit of that, but not, not as many, I don't think, or any that I can think of are perhaps Pablo Escobar are so actively engaged in trying to literally destroy it as a result, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and also, you know, I think some, if, you know, so as you, what you say is true, you know, there's very, I mean, I th maybe that's like one of the definitions of crime that you do not really respect the rules that we all agreed on living by. Um, but there is, if you, but then if you speak to, to criminals, you know, there is also like, there is some sort of functionality to some instrumentalism to what they what they do and why they do not follow the rules and and what i just found talking to uh, many people about this subject trying to understand you know what is really going on here most people do not understand they don't you know they say yeah violence okay that we live by a code and you live by that code and sometimes you die by that code but this is also like it has some sort of irrationalism in it that a lot of people, also successful people in the criminal world, do, do not really understand. Mm, mm. Yeah, and finally, like yesterday, you you were there, you heard the verdict. Mm. You know, you're saying to me that in the Netherlands, life is life. Now there is an appeals process, and no doubt he will mm -hmm. continue yeah. to agitate through that. But realistically, a court that has gone on that long, and it being just a, a judge court, no jury. It's, you know, it, it is what it is. He's pretty much facing the rest of his days in prison. Um, you spoke about how it has been like to be a crime journalist in the Netherlands. Mm. And it's been a really uncomfortable job to do. Um, you know, colleagues of yours are, are living in conditions they never, ever signed up to when they started their career. Mm. And, you know, obviously Peter Orr de Vries has been so tragically murdered on, on a street um, in Amsterdam, like when you sat there yesterday and you got that verdict, you knew it was kind of coming. You were, you would have been really completely and utterly flabbergasted if he had have walked or whatever. But nonetheless, does it feel like it'll make it a bit safer now? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I mean, I've been, you know, I've been talking a lot with, you know, colleagues of yours in, in different mm. countries. And, and I'm also still thinking to myself, okay, make sure that you watch your words, what, what you say. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, one of the things I thought when I was listening to the verdict and at one point the judge said, you know, use the word terror to describe the consequences of, of the actions of Tahi and the motivation behind it. And I was thinking, okay, these judges, they're also all under, uh, you know, they're in, in uh, security programs. They yeah. cannot, you know, today go for a run or decide, you know, my job is done. I'm going to go to the movies for three days because I need some. Um, they cannot move around freely. And I thought to myself, Jesus, you know, there is a lot of criticism on these for these judges and some of it is is right. And but for them, this case has also been like, it changed their lives around completely. And then to, to uh, you know, to conclude something like that about a person that you know has this violent spell in him, it also means that they sign up for a long time of being, you know, you know not being able to move around free. 
and for me personally i've i have had no problems with that so i, I hope it stays that way mm. um but yeah i think it's gonna it's gonna take some time to uh, to wear off but there's there's a lot of people who have been actually traumatized by that one individual i think so yeah i think i i think you know if you look at judges and also district attorneys and, and, you know, a lot of them do their job and it's, you know, if you, if you see the court as a, as a theater, they are playing their role. Um, but they never signed up to being in their role to, to, to be pulled into the criminal world. And that is really what this trial did. You know, when, when the lawyer of the, of the deal witness Nabil was, was killed, all these people felt that they could be next. Mm, mm. And for instance, you know, we have, uh, there is a rule that, that states that, you know, if you're a public prosecutor, your name is uh, on the desk when you're at a public trial. It doesn't happen anymore. Uh, all the, 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 the prosecutors, but also all the judges that are in cases that are linked to this big Marengo trial, they all request to be able to be anonymous. So that's, I mean, that's sort of, yeah, is that really important? Maybe, maybe not, but it sort of symbolizes the fear within uh, the magistrative uh, court and in the, 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 the prosecutor's office. They're all afraid of the consequences that they're, you know, that, that what they're doing could have. And that sort of shows you the fear in Dutch society, because if they are afraid, yeah, that's that fear spreads amongst other people. And I know stories of, of policemen, you know, that that sitting in a cafe with an appointment and then he's like, yeah, yeah, we're not alone. And then you look around and you see two guards. And at one point, this person is looking at his phone. And it's like, yeah, there is this car with, you know, uh, um, uh, with the license plate is registered as a possible security breach. He's like, it's okay for now, but if that car parks around the corner, we have a problem here. Mm. I mean, there there is a lot more people that we know that live under these kind of circumstances and work under these kind of circumstances. And uh, as I said, that that you know that that fear that is comes with that spreads. And I think it's going to take a really long time for it to wear off. Mm. Mm. I'm and afraid. Yeah, no, I can totally understand that. I can, I can totally. And let's look. Let's hope that Taggy is a a rarity. That he is. Yeah. You know, there is a finite amount of human beings born that have that amount of power and ability to spread that kind of fear and terror. Yeah. Um, many of them actually become world rulers, don't they? But you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have some uh, actually ruling the world right now. That's it. That's it. Well, Jan, thank you very much for that. And uh, going forward, let's hope things calm down there now to some extent while we all are in the business of crime in some way. It's it's been yeah. it's been really terrible for the last the last while in the Netherlands and I hope things get a bit better now that we have that um that life uh, sentence for Taggy. Yes. I'm I'm waiting for uh, the next news on the Kinahans. I <laughs> know uh, uh, my turn next. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Let's hope not. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs, and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.